So having considered mechanical digestion in the previous video, we're now going to go on and think about chemical enzyme based digestion. And there's three main types of enzymes found in the gastrointestinal tract. Proteases, lipases and amylases. So these are the three main classifications of enzymes. And this isn't surprising really because proteases, so they've got an A's on the end, means enzyme, A's and uh, A's. And then the first part of the word usually describes the uh, substrate that the enzyme works on. So prote, protease, you can see that's going to A's or be an enzyme for protein. Lip, fat lip, lip is to do with fat. So lipase, they will digest fats. And amylases, amylase is related to carbohydrates. So these are the carbohydrate digesting enzymes. So most of the enzymes that we come across, the vast majority of digestion is done by enzymes in these three categories. So any enzyme that breaks down proteins is a protease, any enzyme that breaks down fats or lipids is a lipase, and any enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates is a amylase. So now we want to go on and think about the components of the gastrointestinal tract and the enzymes that are present there. And we're going to start off by thinking about the salivary glands. And the salivary glands are going to produce saliva. Now there's three main pairs of salivary glands. Two parotid glands, two submandibular glands, and two sublingual salivary glands. So if we think about a face, I do hope your drawing's better than mine. But there we have our person in, uh, in profile. Now, the parotid salivary glands are up at the, uh, the sort of side of the head here around going up to the bottom of the ear. So this is the area here of the parotid salivary glands. And then coming round here, underneath the tongue, so of course the tongue is in the mouth, tongue's in there, and lingual means to do with the tongue. So the sublingual salivary glands are going to be under the uh, tongue. So the sublingual are going to be there. Sublingual glands there in red in this case. And then the submandibular salivary glands, as the name would suggest, under the mandible, more, more lateral, this sort of position here. And uh, of course there's two of these, two of these, and two of these. So parotid, sublingual, and uh, submandibular salivary glands. One gland on each side, they're in pairs. Now what a lot of people don't appreciate is that in the mouth, in the oral submucosa, there's several hundred other smaller salivary glands as well. But the, most of the saliva is produced in these three pairs of salivary glands. And of course you might have heard of a condition that's uh, common in childhood called infective parotitis. You might have heard that that is called uh, mumps or infective parotitis. And certainly I remember as a child being very ill with very swollen parotid salivary glands. We called it mumps because it's a virus. It's a viral infection and it causes swelling of the uh, parotid glands. Usually it's worse on one side, but it can involve both parotid glands. And the patients very generally are unwell. What we used to call general malaise. I felt ill for days with this and uh, fever as well. And one of the things about mumps is it is very contagious. It's spread by respiratory droplet infection. It's got a relatively long incubation period. But the thing about mumps is um, the reason it's a problem is it can have uh, complications. There can be sequelae. So it can lead to meningitis, uh, pancreatitis, 
uh, inflammation of the heart, uh, deafness, um, testicular inflammation, which can um, result in uh, problems with fertility. It can affect the ovaries as well. So uh, be grateful that we're living in the phase of the uh, the, the measles, mumps, rubella and the, the, the mumps vaccines. And we see much less of this condition now. But most of the time these glands are happily producing saliva going into the mouth via their ducts producing saliva as we noted on a previous video under the influence of the parasympathetic nervous system. Now in terms of the function of saliva what the saliva is doing is uh, the salivary amylase is the main digestive enzyme in saliva and what will that that will do is will convert starch which is a polysaccharide Starch is the most common form of carbohydrate uh, in our diet. So potatoes, bread, pasta, rice, all very high in starch. And it will break those down into, uh, mostly it breaks them down into the disaccharide maltose. So it starts that digestion of starch. And uh, maltose, another small sugar unit. Maltose is actually a two sugar unit. It also breaks it down into some three sugar units. And when the saliva is swallowed with the food bolus, this can actually carry on working for about an hour, especially in the fundus of the stomach, until uh, eventually it's neutralised by gastric acid, because this likes a, a relatively alkaline environment. And of course, the medium in the stomach is acid and the acidity in the stomach will come to neutralise the salivary amylase. And you can kind of do a test for this yourself. So if you get a bit of bread, put it in your mouth, that contains starch, of course. And if you sort of chew it up a bit and swill it around your mouth, if you don't swallow it, then the salivary amylose is going to progressively break the starch down into maltose. Now, the starch doesn't taste sweet, whereas the maltose does taste uh, somewhat sweet. So it can start to taste sweet as you leave it in your mouth for longer as the salivary amylase is working. Now, so that's the main enzyme in saliva, the salivary amylase, but th there is another enzyme in saliva and that's called lingual lipase, lingual lipase. And lingual again means tongue, so this is from the lingual glands in the tongue. And this actually doesn't work in the mouth, but it's swallowed in the food bolus. And the lingual lipase is actually activated by the acidic environment in the stomach. Because we know this idea that enzymes only work in a particular pH environment and the lingual lipase likes it acidic. So once it's swallowed, it's activated and there'll be some um, activation of the lingual lipase once it gets into the stomach. And the action there is that triglycerides, which are by far the most common fat in the diet, are broken down into fatty acids and also into um, diglycerides. So this is starting off this process of fat digestion and, and a diglyceride is, is a glycerol molecule attached to um, two fatty acids. So it's only cleaved off one of the fatty acids from the triglycerides which contain three fatty acids to a diglyceride which contains two. But it's starting off this process. But the majority of fatty uh, digestion is carried out in the pancreas as we'll see later on in this video, but this does start the process. Although it's not one of the major digestive enzymes that life depends on. So here's our diagram of the digestive system that we now know and love. <laughs> um, so the food's going to be swallowed into the esophagus and it's going to enter into the stomach, of course. The stomach's the next part of the gastrointestinal tract. So we go into the stomach and the digestive enzymes there are going to be produced by the uh, gastric glands, the gastric glands. And the gastric glands are located in the gastric pits. So what we have in the mucosa of the stomach is there are these um, gastric, so that's the top of the mucosa there. Then there's like a pit there in the, in the gastric mucosa. And this pit opens out into two or three uh, gastric glands. So that's the gastric pit, 
within the gastric mucosa and these are gastric glands and of course all of this wall here is lined by uh, cells as you would expect with glands there's got to be secretory cells so there's numerous secretory cells in the walls of the gastric glands down here and also uh, in the neck of the gastric pits up here. Now there's a lot of mucus secreting cells near the, uh, the top of the pit up here to secrete mucus because we need a lot of mucus in the lining the gastrointestinal tract. So these green ones are, are mucus secreting cells. And this is remarkably important because the pits themselves and the uh, gastric lining needs to be, it's absolutely essential that it's lined with uh, mucus. I've drawn it green but in practice it's actually uh, fairly clear. Because lining the stomach we have about one to three millimetres of alkaline mucus lining the surface mucosal cells of the stomach. So there will be further mucosal cells here. And these need to be protected from the gastric juices. So this would be the lumen of the stomach here that these cells need to be protected from. Because in the gastric glands we have another type of cell in the gastric glands and these are parietal cells and the parietal cells produce hydrochloric acid which goes up well they actually produce hydrogen ion and chloride ions but that they soon combine to form the HCl of hydrochloric acid so the gastric environment contains a lot of this very strong acid hydrochloric acid produced by these parietal cells and this is good because any unfortunate bacteria that are swallowed are fairly rapidly dealt with by this very acidic environment in the lumen of the stomach. And as well as that in the gastric glands there's another type of uh, cell, another cell type in the gastric glands and the product of these cells is a uh, pepsinogen and these cells have drawn in blue are called the chief cells, the chief cells and they produce pepsinogen and again this goes up into the gastric into the gastric uh, lumen and the pepsinogen in the gastric lumen is converted to pepsin which is a protein digesting enzyme so what we see is we have hydrochloric acid and uh, protein digesting enzymes now what are these cells made of that comprise the gastric mucosa well uh, the fatty acids of course phospholipid cell membranes but they're also made of proteins so we don't want them getting digested by the protein digesting enzyme the pepsin we don't not want them being eroded by this very strong hydrochloric acid so they need to be protected by this layer of mucus absolutely vital they need to be protected from this juice the gastric juice is sometimes called peptic juice but if there's a problem in the mucosa if there's a hole in the mucosa then can you see that means that these hydro, the hydrochloric acid and the pepsin can get down into the soft tissues and of course they will start digesting it and you'll get a hole or an ulcer caused by peptic juice and a, a hole or an ulcer caused by peptic juice is a peptic ulcer and these can occur in the stomach they can occur in the duodenum and, and you can actually get uh, regurgitation into the lower part of the esophagus for example in a condition like a hiatus hernia so, so this particularly can be a problem if bacteria get into the under the mucus bacteria called helicobacter pylori which can lead to this inflammation causing what is essentially a self-digestive process there are actually some other cells in the, in the gastric uh, pits not going to do those just now but um the other main group of cells in the gastric pits are called G cells and they produce an endocrine hormone called gastrin. But these gastric juices coming out from the gastric pits from the gastric glands, it can amount to uh, two to three litres per day of gastric juices to facilitate the digestive processes in the stomach. 
So let's think about what's happening now. So uh, these gastric glands, as we've mentioned, the chief cells in the gastric glands are producing pepsinogen, and that's going to go into the gastric pits and out into the lumen of the stomach. Now, we don't want an active protein digesting enzyme, which pepsin is, to be formed in the gland itself because the pepsin would immediately start digesting the protein of the gland that had just produced it. So that would be terrible. So we don't want that. So the gastric glands do not produce uh, pepsin. They produce pepsinogen, which is a proenzyme. Now, just before we go on, we notice that pepsin doesn't end in A's, but it is an enzyme. And the reason for this is this was discovered before it was internationally agreed that all enzymes should end in A's. So it is an enzyme, it's just a bit of an old fashioned name. So what actually happens once we get into the lumen of the stomach is the pepsinogen is converted into pepsin. So inactive pepsinogen is converted into active pepsin. And this conversion process takes place under the influence of hydrochloric acid. So the hydrochloric acid, which is in the lumen of the stomach, will convert the pepsinogen into pepsin. And also any pepsin that's in the lumen of the stomach already will also convert pepsinogen into pepsin. So it's activated once it's in the lumen of the stomach, preventing autodigestion. And pepsin is a protein digesting enzyme, it's a protease, and uh, it severs several types of peptide bonds. And that means it breaks down proteins into peptide fragments. So the proteins are broken down by the pepsin into peptide fragments. Because as you probably know, there's about 20 amino acids in human proteins, in human tissues. And we need, we need these amino acids from plants and animals that we eat. So that's one type of amino acid. That's another type. That's another type. You just have to be imaginative on your shapes here. That's another type. Uh, maybe an upside down one there. Like that's another type. That's another type. So there's these different amino acids. And uh, these are held together by peptide bonds. So the amino acids are held together by peptide bonds that form these long chains of peptides, the polypeptides, and these fold into proteins. So what these uh, proteases do, the proteolytic digesting enzymes are going to break these peptide bonds. And pepsin will break several of these, breaking these down into to smaller chains. It's sometimes described as an enteropeptidase. It, it acts on the bonds inside the, inside the long chain of amino acid um, polypeptide units. So it's starting this digestion of uh, protein. And it's doing so in the presence of hydrochloric acid. So the pH in the stomach is going to be around about 2, which we've mentioned is good because that means it's a very hostile environment for bacteria, which we don't want to be infecting the gastrointestinal tract. If they do, we could get food poisoning with vomiting and diarrhoea and things like that. Now, there's actually another enzyme produced in the stomach called gastric lipase. And what this will do is it will break down short chain triglycerides so it's acting on short chain triglycerides <laughs> and it's breaking those down into fatty acids and monoglycerides. And the monoglyceride, as we mentioned, is a glyceride unit with uh, one fatty acid attached to it. So we went from diglycerides to monoglycerides. And we'll, but we'll see that, that really the vast majority of this uh, fat digestion is taking place in the duodenum under the influence of pancreatic lipase, but this just does a, uh, makes a small contribution to the process. So here we have our diagram of the stomach from the Physiology Notes book. We notice the esophagus, the cardiac sphincter, the fundus, the body, the pylorus, this area of the stomach, and the duodenum and the pyloric sphincter. Of course, sometimes in children, the pyloric sphincter can be too tight and we get pyloric stenosis. Stenosis means narrowing of. 
and that means that the food can't get through into the duodenum and that can cause the stomach to contract vigorously leading to projectile uh, projectile vomit and we refer these to our surgical colleagues who are able to fix this usually food going down to the duodenum and from the physiology notes book this is a picture of the gastric pits it's just a just an alternative diagram really where we notice the uh, the gastric pits these will be the uh, gastric glands down here producing the hydrochloric acid producing the pepsinogen which is converted to pepsin and of course all this would be protected by a layer of mucus protecting the top of the gastric mucosa Here's a blow-up diagram of a gastric pit, again from the Physiology Notes book. And it uh, just reviews what we've uh, already sketched out, that we've got the, uh, the parietal cells producing the hydrochloric acid, the G cells, which we haven't gone into in detail, producing the endocrine hormone gastrin, and the chief cells producing uh, pepsinogen, all going into the lumen of the stomach where it's the peptic juice. So next we're going to go from the stomach down into the first part of the small intestine which of course is the duodenum and that takes us into the territory of the pancreas and the pancreatic juices.